1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was sworn into his third term as President of the United States. The only president in our history to serve more than two terms. In 1941, a new house cost right around $4,000. Gas sold for 12 cents a gallon. You could buy a new, good, quality, name brand car for about 850 bucks. At the movie theaters, Orson Welles had just released his masterpiece, Citizen Kane. The Maltese Falcon was playing, the Humphrey Bogart. And for our younger visitors, those movies are in black and white. They didn't do color <laughs> at this point. On the radio, Glenn Miller was swinging with the Chet and the Choo Choo while the Andrews sisters were breaking hearts singing, I'll be with you at Apple Blossom time. Commercial television, believe it or not, started in the United States in 1941. And in the entire country, there were 7,000 television sets, 5,000 in New York City. I don't believe Florida was included in that. There were 48 states in 1940s. Alaska and Hawaii were still more than a decade away from achieving statehood. This is the atmosphere these gentlemen came out of school and began their lives as adults, went into the U.S. Army Air Force, and lived the experiences that we're here to talk about today. Now, it's worth talking a little bit about aviation itself, because we're all used to an incredibly safe, reliable airspace system, an aircraft that actually depart on time and get where they're supposed to go. That was not the case in the 40s. And I'm not talking about wartime alone. Flying itself was a risky business in the 1940s. Consider these statistics from the U.S. Army Air Forces. During the war years, 1941 to 1945, there were 47,462 crashes in training. That's here. That's not in wartime. This resulted in 13,621 fatalities of air crew. That's a town. And that's just in training. This is an extremely hard endeavor these gentlemen undertook. And that should give us a little bit of an insight into what it took to get into aviation in the 1940s. Now, each of these gentlemen has an interesting little quirk to their life. They each spent time as a POW. They each were shot down, found themselves in a position of having to put down an enemy territory. Now, it may seem foreign to us, but the POW experience was a worldwide phenomenon because this was a world war. There were POW camps all over. 45 of the 48 states in the United States had POW camps. Florida had 26. One was in Winterhaven. Unlike the European experience, many prisoners who stayed here chose to stay afterwards. Some of them married local girls or came back and set up lives here. These gentlemen had a very different experience, and we'll talk about that a little bit. With that, I think it's appropriate to start with our first question. And this is slightly different than the morning session we did because we've been talking a bit backstage. Rudy, I'd like to ask you specifically. You were shot down returning from a bombing run to Stuttgart, which was your father's hometown. You're bilingual. You speak German fluently. What was your experience with the language barrier between captors and captives, and how did that experience shape the prison of war experience? Well, right after I was captured, I spoke German to the uh, guards that, that uh, picked me up. But when the Gestapo got there, I, I just gave my name or rank and serial number, and from there on, I just get the. But once I got into the camp, I acted as a translator and interpreter. But there was a catch to it, because when I got into the camp, they interrogated each person that came in. If you saw the movie, oh, what was it, uh, Stalag 17, and William Holden, um, I think he was being questioned about uh, whether or not he was truly a, no, there was another fellow that came into the camp that was, uh, uh, had a German accent, and they, they determined that he was German, of course, they got rid of him right away. So the same thing happened to me when I got in. Uh, they interrogated me, and there was a fellow from Jamestown, North Dakota, who interrogated me. And, uh, and he said, who's the governor of North Dakota? And I said, John Moses. And he said, no, it's Bill Langer. Well, Bill Langer had been the previous governor, but John Moses was from my hometown. I knew him very well, and his son was my best friend. So uh, they 
thought that maybe I wasn't from North Dakota and they questioned my crew and my crew said that, uh, well, we just met him at uh, Kearney, Nebraska and we were leaving. The day before we left, I was switched to this crew. So they didn't really know me. So it took about three or four months before a fellow came up from Western North Dakota who could verify that I was from Hazen, North Dakota and that I had gone to college in North Dakota. So that, that made a bit of a problem. But I did do a lot of translating, a lot of interpreting, and it, I think it helped me a bit because I, I felt very comfortable with the Germans. Now, did any of the rest of you have an experience with the language barrier when you, we, any of us who have been in Europe and find ourselves not speaking French or German or Italian have a little bit of an issue ordering dinner. You had a somewhat more intense experience. Was it difficult being unable to talk to your captors easily? Jack, did you have anything with that? Yes, it was. It was difficult. And number one, you don't know what they're saying. Number two, all you do is what they tell you to do. You don't argue, you don't fight, and you just do what you have to do. Now, the, the people that gave us the hard time were the young kids. I say young kids, they looked like they were about 12 or 13 years of age. I don't know how old they were, but they thought they were a big deal with the rifle. They poked you in the ribs, kicked you with the big German boots, point in the direction they want you to go, do it. Don't argue with those <coughs> German shepherd police dogs, believe me. You're, you're lose every time. And yes, communication was Hard. Hard. One of the things we were talking about before we came in here, and these gentlemen do have fascinating stories to tell, was something we all take for granted as Americans. Food. We have food everywhere. We have fast food places. You don't even have to get out of your car. They'll hand food to you. But as a POW, food was a challenge. Ben, can you tell us a little bit about Red Cross packages and what that meant to a prisoner of war who maybe didn't eat regularly? Well, it meant we had uh, something to eat all the time because uh, the Red Cross furnished enough packages where if we run out of food in one package, why well, you get a new one? And uh, there was all kinds of food in there, canned things like beans and, and et cetera, and, and even chocolate bars. And, uh, we managed to get along, in my outfit, we managed to get along pretty well with that food and, and uh, didn't really starve or have a long time without anything to eat. Thank you. George, you had some experience with being in camp and not eating on a regular basis. Can you tell us anything about that? Thank you for again. About being in the camps and not having access to food. Well, <laughs> that's the main thing that we had trouble with. <clears throat> I, I went down to 190 pounds, and uh, <clears throat> when I got, got out, I weighed 110 pounds. <clears throat> so the food problem was a major thing. Our, our daily diet was a hunk of uh, back row bread where you could put about three slices up for breakfast and maybe three slices up for dinner and for three slices up for supper and the slices are about an uh, inch and a half square. Uh, that was your thing and we toasted them, took the old cook stove down and turned them on their side and used the cook stove as a uh, stove and uh, we, we bake it to the very hard because it was 70 percent wood and 30 percent of grain and i tell you it was a hearty food <laughs> and uh, another thing they served us once in a while was, was fish cake and that would make Limburg, limburger cheese uh, <laughs> no no comparison and that's the stinkiest stuff that i've ever seen in my life <laughs> <laughs> very few vegetables and uh, no fruit and uh, green death. They would take dried cabbage and uh, make a soup out of it and that was our uh, thing and we used the worms that came in the soup for our proteins. And, uh, 
it was not a desirable table, but <coughs> we had very little food. And, uh, we got the soup one time a day. And that's about as much as I can say about it. It was very, very enticing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Lest we be of the opinion that everything was dark and dreary and miserable, and certainly the POW experience was, you got to keep in mind that these dashing young men were in their early 20s. They had flat stomachs, they had full heads of hair, they were somewhat attractive, and they were a big deal in their hometowns. <laughs> um, Rudy, your wife was telling me a story about paying a couple girls for an airplane ride. Would you care to, this was stateside before going to Europe, would you care to relate to us what a young man with wings was doing on his off time? We were in town in Walla Walla, Washington. We were in the B-17. Uh, it was a transition getting ready to fly over to England. And we did some practice uh, bombing runs on Boardman Range in uh, Oregon and also target ships out over the Pacific, just off the coast. And so uh, we do these at about 26,000 feet. It was very cold up there, but we were pretty well dressed. But it, I was in town, I was flying co-pilot with a guy by the name of Les Hoffman, and we were in town at the service club, and we met a couple of ladies. Uh, obviously, they were married, but they were out for a good time. We asked them if they'd ever had an airplane ride, and all well, they had it. So Les threw out a map of the base and said, no. And they didn't have guards around the field at all at that time. It wasn't security like we have nowadays. So uh, he told them that he'd be at the end of the runway at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning and wait for the flashlight to flash three times and then run out to the airplane. So when we got there, he flashed the flashlight. We had told the enlisted men that we were going to take some passengers along. We just didn't use our brains. <laughs> we thought we'd drop bombs at about 8,000 feet of board bridge and come right back. But when we got to the plane, it had a whole load of gas and made us a little suspicious of what our mission was. And then when we got airborne, we were told we were to bomb a target ship out over the, uh, near Portland, Oregon, on the Pacific. And here we had these girls along go up to 26,000 feet, had to get them on oxygen, <laughs> and we had to get close, so we had to take off some of ours to give them, to keep them warm enough. And we got, uh, we managed to get out and to get back. I tell you, we never saw those girls again. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there are a couple of grandmas now who sleep. We flew in a bomber out of the Sure, Grandma. I guess the moral of the story is that if you meet a woman in her early 90s who says she flew out of B-17 in World War II, give her the benefit of the doubt. <laughs>